Hi guys, so today we continue with uh, some of the performance issues that arise in networks and how to think about what affects network performance. So the first thing to discuss is are the forwarding methods that happen in networks. So since 1970s, basically since the start of the internet, really the technique that enabled the internet um, at a large scale is packet switching. And packet switching relies on store and forward, which basically means that we take some data that we want to send. This could be a large file or a, a video stream or whatever. And the data as it's being generated fills up a packet or basically there is some data uh, that we want to transmit. The data goes to the transport layer as discussed previously. A packet is created or a segment is created. And then um, ultimately that segment is passed onto the IP layer where we get a packet and that packet then is forwarded over the network layer. So the way the packet is forwarded is we kind of start transmitting data from the packet and that goes over um, the transmission medium, say a wire to a router and that packet then kind of fills up or the, as, as bytes for that packet arrive, eventually we have the whole packet. Once we have the whole packet, only then can we start forwarding any of it forward. The reason for that is that we want to kind of process that packet, see where it needs to go. Sometimes we can make the decision right on the headers, but um, in general, there is a separate function of data arriving and then a separate function of data being forwarded. And in this process, a long stream of data is divided into, into those packets. Okay. What happened before, or what happens, um, well, it doesn't really happen in phone networks before, but before the internet, before packet switching, we had circuit switching, or basically telephone networks. So when you had a telephone conversation going on, you would actually um, reserve the entire connection on end-to-end -end basis. So sometimes you would have to wait a long time, like in whatever, 50s or 60s, to even get a connection established. Right, especially when it was going across to a different city, like a long-range phone call. So what happens there is that you basically reserve some portion of the bandwidth on end-to-end -end basis. And um, if you reserve the entire wire, there could be only one conversation at a time that uses these particular links. Um, but we can actually divide the bandwidth on a particular link or a, on a set of links. Um, by time division, multiple access or TDMA, where um, different conversations basically take turns over time. Or frequency division, multiple access, where we divide this into multiple frequencies. And um, this is sort of what we more naturally use in conversation. If you want an analogy, uh, this is possible. You can give it a try where you're trying to have a conversation or pay attention to multiple conversations uh, if two people if one pair of people is speaking in a high voice and another pair of people is speaking in a low voice it's a little bit of stretch but we can do it if you want to give it a try um, so this method of circuit switching basically has gone away in the internet infrastructure even though it is still used at a higher layer to basically reserve some bandwidth maybe between one company office and another company office. We'll come back to the circuit switching idea um, when we talk about MPLS, but even if we do this at the application layer or a session layer, eventually what happens in the internet are IP packets being forwarded using packet switching, which basically makes it easier to interweave data at a router from multiple flows, whereas here that opportunity is limited uh, and it needs to be uh, is limited by kind of TDMA or FDMA, and there's additional difficulties in signaling to establish, um, sorry, my mouse just died, um, to establish these sort of end-to-end -end connections. Okay, mouse is back, great. So, if you think about it um, in terms of performance though, um, which method do you think would give you better end-to-end -end delay better flow throughput and better network throughput. Okay, we can pause the video and have a second to think about it.
Okay? So let's look at the advantages of packet switching. It is more efficient to carry bursty data. Why is that? Well, you have a flow that maybe sometimes sends less data, sometimes sends more data. And so if you wanted to reserve bandwidth for kind of the maximum flow of data, a lot of the time you might be not using all that bandwidth. And now um, in circuit switching, that would basically mean wasted bandwidth. Whereas with packet switching, you're basically using as much data as, as you're sending. Um, so there's no reason to, to reserve and kind of multiple flows as they're being bursty can work around each other effectively. It is simpler to set up. There is no call setup. You basically just start sending data. You don't need to reserve and to end resources. But the downside is that you have variable delay. And because you don't have a reservation for some set of some uh, set bandwidth, you are sending what you can or the, the packets that you want to send. And so are other people. And so you can end up with queuing or collisions of packets. We'll talk about that in a second in more detail. But you don't get any guarantees on end-to-end on -end performance. And so as a result, you're going to need protocols that provide reliability, congestion control, um, that kind of allow multiple flows to coexist and provide reliable service, even though we don't have an end-to-end -end reservation. Okay. On the other hand, with circuit switching, you have lower end-to-end -end delay. Well, you reserved all the bandwidth, so um, there is no queuing, there's no, there's no waiting for an opportunity to transmit. But if you're not transmitting data for some period, for example, it turns out that voice data is highly bursty. Right? I'm speaking and then at some point I'm taking a pause. And those pauses can be quite long in terms of network time where there's no data being sent. And if I reserve bandwidth, um, that quiet time would be wasted, wouldn't be available to anybody else to transmit. Um, and then you do need complicated protocols for resource reservation to basically reserve a set of links on end-to-end -end basis. What happens if one of the links fails? Can you kind of move a reservation onto another set of links? What is an efficient path to choose that doesn't kind of cut off other parts of the network? Um, these are quite difficult to implement and in fact uh, harder than these types of protocols for reliability and congestion control which just provide probabilistic uh, performance. All right, so when we come back to our end-to-end -end delay, well, the lowest end-to-end -end delay is you're going to get with circuit switching once you establish a circuit, of course, right? You can just start sending data, so there's no queuing, and there is no store and forward, so as soon as a bit of data arrives at one router, that router can immediately forward it. It doesn't need for the packet to finish arriving before the packet is forwarded. Okay. Um, for flow throughput, well, actually also circuit switching wins because you can reserve the bandwidth that you want and no one else is going to infringe upon it. So that's cool. But for network throughput, turns out that packet switching is much more effective. It basically allows multiple flows to um, interweave and to not hug bandwidth that they're not using and so for the network as a whole packet switching is much much better right and so this turns out to be a good economic proposition right more performance for more people is better um, and it makes more effective use of investment in links because all of them are being used or it's much easier to move traffic around so that all of them are used um, and so that basically Packet switching is probably the single most important reasons behind the success of the internet um, in kind of performance as well as commercial terms. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about network performance. What we want is uh, packets to data to be sent quickly on end to end basis. We want to reach, uh, send our data to the destination as quickly as possible. Okay? But there are things that happen in a packet switch network that introduce delay. Okay? So the first source of delay is packet processing. So we have a packet arriving at a router and the router needs to parse that packet to figure out where it needs to go. For example, to make a routing decision, do I forward it left or do I forward it right? So there's some processing of arriving data that has to happen. Then once we know what to do with the packet, we're gonna, the router is going to schedule it for transmission on an outgoing link. Now that outgoing link is going to have a buffer from which packets are being trans picked up and transmitted. 
So when we're done processing a packet, it goes into this buffer and then it has to wait to get to the front of the queue, which is the queuing delay. All right. Once we have the packet at the front of the queue, we may need to wait for an opportunity to transmit. If it's a fiber link, this happens immediately. If it's a Wi-Fi link though, we may need to wait for other people to finish speaking or finish or to finish transmitting on that Wi-Fi link before um, we can start transmitting. So that's the kind of delay of medium access, accessing the transmission medium. Then it takes a while to actually transmit the packet at the data rate of the link. All right. So let's say that you have a sentence to speak that is your packet and you produce speech at a particular rate. And so it might take you a second or two to uh, speak the entire sentence. All right. The faster you can speak, the lower the serialization delay for that sentence. So if we're transmitting a thousand bits and we have some, uh, uh, let's say one kilobit per second bandwidth, it's going to take us uh, one second to transmit, uh, to serialize all those bits. All right. And then finally, once they're serialized or once a bit is serialized, we have the propagation delay, which is how long it takes for the signal to reach uh, the destination or the next hop from the source or, or from the previous hop. And so that propagation is often tied in some way to the speed of light, the speed of light in fiber, the speed of light in atmosphere, if we're transmitting Wi-Fi or other electromagnetic uh, or, or in, in other electromagnetic spectrum. It could be the speed of propagation of electricity in a copper wire. You get the idea. Okay, so to figure out the delay on a hop, you need to add up all these different factors. Okay, sometimes they're easy to understand, sometimes they're not. Um, and then if you wanna calculate end-to-end -end delay, you need to add up all these different factors on all the different links on an end-to-end -end path. And that's your end-to-end -end delay. Okay. What can also happen, however, is that packets can be lost, right? So there are two basic sources of packet loss. First one is buffer overflow. So we have a packet um, that is arriving on this link. We have a packet that is arriving on this link. Okay, and we have packets that are going out on this link. If we assume that all these links have the same bandwidth and there is same sending rate at the bandwidth of the link, we have twice as much data arriving here than we're able to transmit in any given period of time. Because arriving packets go into an outgoing queue, that queue will grow, right? Because we have more packets going in per time, per unit of time than going out. Band, uh, sorry, memory on these routers is not infinite. And so eventually there will be no more space in that buffer for new packets those packets will be dropped, simply forgotten, not inserted into this buffer, and um, they will be lost, they will need to be retransmitted. So that's basically the buffer overflow problem. The other source of packet loss is interference. Let's say that you're transmitting a packet on a Wi-Fi link and someone turns on a microwave right next to your router. Why would you put a router right next to a microwave? I don't know, because you live in a small apartment. And so, as a result, there would be enough interference from the microwave on the Wi-Fi link that the receiver wouldn't be able to decode um, the packets. You can think of it as you trying to speak, uh, have a conversation with somebody and right next to you a jackhammer starts. And so your, uh, the person you're talking to will not be able to hear what you're saying or hear everything that you're saying and they will ask you to repeat whatever it is that you said. All right, so those are the factors that affect sources of, that are the sources of delay and sources of loss in networks, okay? But let's take a look at an um, analogy, all right? So if we assume that our network is a machine that produces uh, chocolate chip cookies, okay? And so they are being generated at some rate here, basically dropped on this tape. This tape uh, moves forward and delivers the cookies. What, uh, how can we think of this in terms of network performance? Okay, so we can think of processing delay as the time 
well, in the network context, is the time it takes to read an incoming packet, determine which link to transmit the packet to, and form packet headers, right? All these things we're going to get into. So, basically, in terms of our chocolate chip analogy, this is the, si the time to set up the chocolate chip making machine to do some work. All right, then we have queuing delay, um, which is the time it takes for the packet to get to the front of the queue. And... Um, in terms of our chocolate chip making machine, this would be the time to finish the run of white chocolate chips to start the regular chips, right? So we need the, uh, the, whatever, the dark chocolate to get to the front of the funnel after the white chocolate is, is uh, uh, deposited onto the, onto the tape. All right, then we have medium access delay, um, which is the time a packet has to wait until uh, the transmission medium is free. Okay, and then we can wait for the conveyor to reach the correct speed. Uh, you can also think of it as the wait time for the next row of um, chocolate chip cookies to be deposited. You gotta wait for the previous row to kind of move away first, right? Um, you have serialization delay, which is uh, how quickly we can put bits onto the transmission medium. And in terms of our chocolate chip machine, this would be the time to drip down a batch of 1,000 chocolate chip cookies, right? Um, and that depends kind of on tape speed and kind of your uh, chocolate squirt rate. All right, and then finally we have propagation delay, um, which is the time a bit will take to traverse a link. And in terms of chocolate chip cookies, chocolate, sorry, keep saying cookies, just chocolate chips. The time it takes for the first line of the chips to cool before they are packed at the end of the conveyor, right? So this conveyor has some length that allows these um, chips to cool. All right. Um, and then we can think of the buffer overflow. It's when the rate of arriving packets exceed the sending rate of the packets and they queue up, right? And you can sort of think of it in terms of the analogy as the box collecting chips at the end of the conveyor will fill up and new chips will be dropped to the floor. All right, so that's uh, a very direct buffer overflow illustration. And then interference, when a transmitted packet collides with another packet on the transmission medium and neither one can be decoded, um, we can think of it as the interferer being someone standing there and just snagging chips of the conveyor belt as they're, as they're cooling. I'll definitely try doing that. Okay, so let's see if you guys can kind of adapt uh, these ideas to, to try to figure out what may happen in networks of different type. Okay, so what is the likely dominant source of end-to-end -end delay in a cellular network? Okay. Um, likely this will be congestion from too many people streaming video. Okay, congestion would impact uh, medium access, right? Because you just have to wait uh, longer to uh, get to um, to get your opportunity to transmit. Okay, what about in a residential Wi-Fi network? Well, this would be the contention from nearby Wi-Fi networks or microarrays. Often, um, each of the links has enough bandwidth, but because there are neighboring links on the same Wi-Fi channels, um, the effective bandwidth is reduced because of collisions with nearby routers. Okay. And what about a core ISP network during peak hours? Well, this often happens in, in Bozeman where the congested links are actually between core routers or um, the routers that are connecting Bozeman to other parts of the state and other parts of the internet. So we can put these on um, our graphic here, where cellular network is probably most likely limited by medium access delay. Wi-Fi network suffers from interference and core ISP network suffers from queuing on these long range links. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about um, loss of, about network performance in terms of loss of throughput, okay? So throughput is, basically how much data can be pushed over a network. Okay? So if we look at an access link from uh, a, an end host to a router, maybe this is a really terrible link and you only have 
1.5 megabits per second. So this is a low capacity link, which um, even though it's dedicated to this host, uh, its bandwidth is limited. Okay? Now we can look at another terrible link, which is 1.5 megabits per second between this router and the next router. Okay? And so if those two nodes and host are sending data at one megabits per second, there's no way both of them can um, achieve this, that effective uh, throughput on end-to-end -end basis um, if there is this congested link um, here where uh, basically packets will start queuing up and some of them will effect effectively eventually be dropped. Okay, so we can think of those as bottleneck links. So um, let's look at, let's talk a little bit more about uh, metrics of delivery rate. So you can think of a network, this is not the, not the perfect analogy, but it's pretty good. You can think of network as a pipe or a series of pipes or as, uh, was it Al Gore that said it, a series of tubes? Um, good enough. So through those series of tubes, we are sending some data and you can think of it as some liquid traveling through a pipe. Okay. So if we talk about the capacity of a link, it's um, basically the thickness of the pipe. How much fluid or how much water can we maximally pass through this pipe? Okay. Um, now, it's not perfect because you can also talk about the pressure in the pipe, right? And so uh, you can possibly move the data faster under higher pressure, but basically the thickness of the pipe is kind of the limiting factor of that and maybe the serialization rate is the pressure at which you're moving data through, assuming this pipe is already filled. Okay, so then you have available bandwidth, which is the airspace above the flow, right? You could potentially send more liquid through this um, if you have space above in the pipe, okay? Now, achievable throughput is the share of bandwidth achieved by a flow. So let's say you have more than one flow or maybe more than one kind of uh, fluid. Maybe you have, uh, I don't know, water is water. Maybe you have like two different colors of water or something, right? And um, uh, you're sending both of them to this pipe. They're getting mixed. And so um, maybe one of the flows, maybe this pipe is already full, right? And you're sending one liquid at a higher pressure than another. And so the higher pressure liquid will um, basically get more of the share of the bandwidth or capacity than uh, the low pressure liquid. Okay. And then good put is the metric of how much data you're actually delivering um, to an application, right? So you could be sending a lot of data in the network, but maybe some of it starts getting, um, uh, maybe some of it is lost right, due to, due to buffer overflows, maybe some of it is corrupted on links, right? So you could be actually sending a lot more data, but as the data gets to the, to the destination, it is not usable for some reason, right? And so good put is a measure of how much um, data is actually being received and passed on to the application or at what rate the data is passed to the application, okay? So basically what you need to worry about is the capacity, which is how much data could be sent. Um, throughput, which is how much data is actually being pushed through the network, and then good put, which is how much data is actually being delivered. Often we just, we talk about capacity and throughput, but uh, it's just good to know for you guys that these do break down further. All right, so the last thing that I want to uh, talk about today, I think, is queuing delay, right? So I mentioned that as we are sending data into a router um, after processing, actually let me find a different graphic for this. Here we go. After processing, those packets are being queued and then that queue is being served on the outgoing link. So the more queuing there is, the more or the longer these queues, the longer the queuing delay, the longer it takes for a packet to traverse a router or basically traverse to the front of the queue before it can be serialized. So Queuing results is the result of congestion, and um, this is what this slide shows. Okay, so let's assume that we have some link bandwidth or capacity. We're going to call this B, 
And then we're going to break this down into packet length, which is L in bits, and the average packet arrival rate. We can kind of multiply these together, L times A, to figure out how much data is being injected into the network. Right? And then um, B is basically how much data can be served in a network or forwarded. Okay? So let's say that, that the ratio of LA or the injection rate to B is small, right? meaning that we are injecting into the network much less that than uh, it can forward. Right? Cubing delay would be small. So you can think of this as basically this kind of roadway where there's only one vehicle on the road and there is no cubing delay. This vehicle is traveling as quickly as it possibly can. Okay? Now, on the other hand, the ratio of LA to B, or how much data we're sending a network versus how much data it can forward, starts approaching one. Okay? And now average queuing delay gets large. And this is shown on this graph, right? As we are, as the ratio of LA to B starts approaching one, the average queuing delay will increase. Okay? And um, the idea here is that as packets are arriving, at about the same rate that they can be forwarded, right? Because this traffic is bursty, these will eventually, this will start creating a queue, right? Maybe the queue, maybe the sending rate exceeds B, and so this queue grows, grows large, and then maybe it's lower than B for a while, and so it starts getting served, right? But basically this queue will uh, start growing larger because of the burstiness of, of uh, traffic, as um, we start approaching this um, LA equals B equals uh, LA over B uh, starts approaching one. Okay, but now what can happen is that we are sending more data than the network can serve, right? So this ratio goes over one, right? The delay actually becomes infinite, right? Which is can be illustrated by this picture from LA. <laughs> okay, what happens is that because we are sending more data than can be forwarded, this, this queue starts growing indefinitely, right? Or, per, in, yeah, I guess indefinitely is a fine word, right? And in kind of network queuing theory, this queue becomes infinite, but on routers in practice, this queue is limited by the amount of memory that is on the router, and so eventually packets will start getting lost, while the queuing delay will get quite large because um, a packet will need to make it through potentially uh, gigabytes of data, of queued data to, to make it um, onto the link for, to the next router. Okay, so if we assume that traffic is arriving in a bursty way, meaning that sometimes people are sending data, sometimes they're not, maybe, you know, when I'm speaking, I'm sending data and when I take a pause, I'm not actually serializing any data. Um, so there's a bursty arrival rate. Um, the bursty arrival rate could also happen because, you know, sometimes people request stuff, sometimes they don't. There's this sort of um, interplay between different users or because there are many different users in the network, sometimes all of them are requesting something, sometimes they're not. Um, there's a sort of oscillation or burstiness in the number of requests that are being generated um, per any unit of time. Okay, so if we have bursty arrival rate of traffic, would larger router buffers improve or degrade network performance? Okay, I'll give you guys a second to think about it. All right, so we can think of this buffer here as being very, very, very large, right? So this queue extends all the way here, right? So what happens? Well, if we start sending data and it's bursty, Okay, this queue will start, the length of this queue will start oscillating, right? Data arrives quickly, this queue grows, and then data is served, and so it decreases. Um, and so there's this oscillation in the length of the queue. Okay? Um, if the capacity of this queue is very large, this oscillation will also be large. As a result, the kind of variance in end-to-end -end delay of packets will be large because sometimes a packet is arriving and the queue is short, sometimes a packet is arriving and the queue is long and then it needs to make its way to the front of the queue. So that's not great. As we'll see, TCP doesn't really love um, variable delay. Okay? So 
On the other hand, if this queue is very large, no packets get lost. And so um, all the capacity that has been used to get a packet to a router isn't lost because a packet gets lost or gets dropped out of the queue. Okay, so that's also efficient. So from the point of view of network operators, they like large buffers because that means that um, data doesn't get lost. On the other hand, very large buffers introduce very long end-to-end -end delays and introduce uh, problems for protocols to kind of deal with, with variability and delay. So there is some happy middle ground that um, um, basically requires network protocols to be able to um, work with different size um, buffers. And we'll talk about it more when we get into, the, into TCP. Okay. So basically, large buffers improve network throughput because packets don't get lost, but um, uh, kind of increase end-to-end -end delay and variability of end-to-end -end delay, which is not great for applications and the transport layer. And that's it for today. Um, I expect you guys will have uh, questions about this material. Don't hesitate. Please read the book. It goes into more depth and takes, um, gives you kind of a different explanation of some of these issues. Uh, please read the book. Please come up with questions. Uh, post them on the discussion forum. I'll jump in there and see what questions you guys have. Or, or rather, and or, uh, bring them today. Um, to our live office hours so we can kind of um, talk through them together. All right, thank you guys.